Good morning again. Let's give your Bibles. Let's get ready. Let's turn over to Acts chapter 11 as we continue now in our series, Finding Power for the Mission in Acts. And we took a few weeks off. I remember one thing that I forgot to give praise for. I was able to get myself a new Bible with larger print <laughs> this week. So uh, the page is still a little stiff, but I am very grateful for this because, boy, I was struggling sometimes. And in the book of Acts, in my other Bible, the pages are so thin, they're almost becoming translucent um, because of just flipping them back and forth so many times. And so I was, sometimes I'm up here, I'm like really struggling to read what's in my Bible. And so I needed something larger. Um, and so God provided and I found a good deal as well. And so I'm grateful for God's word that we have such an easy access to it. And so his his mighty provision. And so as we um, turn back to Acts, quick little recap. Um, very quick, because it's been a few weeks since we've been in here. And so if we remember, we were seeing how Peter was sent to the Gentiles. And Cornelius and his household and his guests there, they were ready to receive the gospel. In that time when Peter was presenting a simple but straightforward gospel presentation, there was a holy interruption, we'll call it, where the Holy Spirit, they, they became believers, they were converted, they got uh, regenerated in that moment, even before he finished, and uh, they began uh, speaking in tongues and extolling God. And so just, again, to reiterate, speaking in tongues, speaking in a known language, this would have been something that would have basically told Peter nothing if he didn't understand what they were saying. And so I imagine in a way that these were, these were um, Cornelius was, a, was part of the Italian cohort and um, Romans, they were either speaking Greek or Latin or something, but they probably, maybe when they were extolling God, maybe they were doing it in Hebrew or, or Aramaic, something that would have indicated what was going on, but it was a clear, it wasn't gibberish, it wasn't something that was confusing. Um, Peter and the men that were with him could clearly see the Holy Spirit had filled them and they were praising God. And so Peter remains with them in Caesarea for, for a few days by their request before heading back to Jerusalem. And upon his return, he is met with open arms and warmth and, and here's a nice bed for you to rest and a place to wash your feet. And you know, he was met with criticism when he comes back because of what was going on. He was not met with <laughs> encouragement, but with criticism by the church in Jerusalem because he was eating and meeting with the Gentiles. And so we know that this is a very important part in the book of Acts. God is not playing favorites. He did not bring the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ solely for the Jewish people, though it came through the Jews. And this is why this is repeated. This account is repeated three times. And so this, in the beginning of chapter 11, we saw for the third time Luke, who's the author of Acts, repeat this. The visions, the account of the visions of both Peter's and Cornelius, and the importance of this. <clears throat> so the repetition of the visions and the outcome among the Gentiles is very important. Maybe we lose sight of that a little bit because of where we are, you know, 2,000 years um, future to these events unfolding. We take it for granted. But even to this very day, we deal with some of these prejudices and um, areas of challenge within the church. Sometimes it's from the outside. Sometimes it's, you know, wolves in sheep clothing. It's unbelievers mixed in with believers causing problems and confusion. Other times it's believers and believers just not being quite right. With what God's word I mean, that's why we need to know God's word that's why we need to return to God's word and his truth in it and so in addition to that we have the six Jewish brothers that accompanied Peter from Joppa to Caesarea and then were there also when he gave the account to the Jewish um, believers in Jerusalem they could corroborate his his account of the Gentiles in Caesarea coming to Christ they validated Peter's testimony and so we're going to just, let's just look at verse 18 in chapter 11 to start with here. As we just finish this little recap, it says, 
when they had heard these things, referring to the Jewish believers that were criticizing Peter earlier, when they heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. The battle was over and won, but the war is far from it. The war continues even to this day in different ways, in different forms. Um, the war of prejudice and barriers. But, and we will see it again in the book of Acts as well as in the New Testament, where they'll still, even Peter himself kind of steps back a little bit into those old ways again, of that separation with the Jews and the Gentiles. And he is rebuked by Paul to his face for it. And so we had finished a couple weeks ago when we started chapter 11, we finished the Gentiles are accepted, the first part. And now we'll see the Gentiles are encouraged. We'll be looking at verses 19 through 26. I'm not sure if we'll get through all of them this morning, but that's going to be our main text this morning. And um, we're going to read it here in just a moment. But before we do so, let's just go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to prepare our hearts for this time. Holy Father, you alone are worthy of worship and praise. You are holy, sovereign. And so, Lord, you know how much help we need this morning as we come to your word. Lord, let us come with a, with a fear and trembling with a reverence for who you are, knowing, Lord, that you are the only means by which we can be saved, by which we can be reconciled to God the Father, through Jesus Christ, the Son. And his sacrifice on the cross, and he shed blood for us. For he went to the to the, the cross, he suffered and died, he was buried, and they rose again, and he is alive and seated at the right hand of the Father. And Lord, we thank you for these truths, for this, this truth of the resurrection, of the future hope that we have as believers. And so, Lord, as we spend some time now, please, we ask your Holy Spirit would do the work of speaking through me, giving me clarity in my speech, Lord, also preparing all of our hearts to hear what it is that you need to show us and for us to receive from your word. God, challenge our hearts for evangelism. Challenge our hearts for the lost world around us as we spend time here now. In Jesus' holy and precious name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> so let's, let's read. Starting at verse 19, chapter 11. It says, Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. These were the first called Christians. <clears throat> and so we have the birth of the church here in Antioch. And so number one, it's, or, or, to begin with, the preparation. And so let's, let's look back, actually, as we think of the preparation. Let's actually turn back to Acts chapter 8. Just flip a page over in your Bible or two, or three. And actually, um, we're gonna, let's start at verse 1 in chapter 8. And Saul approved of his execution, referring to Stephen, who was stoned. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentations over him. 
prophet Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. So if we read verse 19 again. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. So we, this is the result of the heavy persecution. So the preparation has begun in Antioch. The result of the heavy persecution we saw back in chapter 8, um, but at the hands, not just of, but, it, but we could say that Saul, or Paul, formerly known as Saul, had a heavy hand in this persecution, as we just read back in, eight, in chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Um, he was the head of that ravaging persecution. He was zealously, fanatically, consistently going house to house to absolutely snuff out these Jesus followers, dragging them off to prison and even voting toward their execution, as, we'll, as Paul admits himself in Acts chapter 26, verse 10. And so we're told that he was looking on with approval at the stoning of Stephen. I thought about this a little bit. I wonder why he didn't lift up any stones to throw. Was it that he didn't want to sully his hands? Was it that he didn't even think it was worth pelting a stone, but he was looking on with approval at those who were, and he was holding the coats of those who were doing it? And this makes me think of Paul's own words that he'll write in pen later on in Romans 132, where he says, though they know God's righteous decrees, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And we talked about back when we looked at Stephen Stoning, how what they had done was really unlawful. Um, and the way they handled it was, was inappropriate. And obviously they couldn't stand with him in a debate. And we don't know for sure, but we, we can imagine that Paul was definitely present for those events. Um, whether he maybe even was engaging in the debate, we don't know. But we know that they couldn't stand against the word of God. Um, they could not debate with Stephen, and so they did the only thing they could do is they, they grabbed him, took him out of the city, and stoned him to death. And Paul, of course, was a part of this. And so now, fast forward, now we're here in chapter 11, and we see that we see, we're still seeing the results of Stephen's um, death. Stephen's faithful witness and preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ led to his martyrdom. And as a result of his death, the flame of the gospel continued to spread. And boy, were the flames fanned. Believers, especially the Hellenists, remember those were the, the um, Greek-speaking Jews who, that lived and were born and raised in, in foreign lands, or predominantly Greek-speaking areas, they had to flee for their lives. And I say especially them because, because they would have stood out a little bit more from the Jerusalem Jewish believers because we know that they did remain in Jerusalem and the church continued to be there. It was some refer to it as the mother, the mother church or the headquarters. And so, but many of the Hellenists were scattered out and yet they fled for their lives and yet the gospel continued to spread. Now that's a convicting thought because I wonder if some of us began to be threatened by uh, with death threats and uh, prison and all this other stuff for being believers, would we, and, and let's say we had to flee or move or exit the country or exit the state, would we be so vocal to continue to proclaim Christ? Or would we want to just kind of gather together, lay low somewhere until things blew over? Uh, I hope that our hearts and desire would say, well, look, we know that persecution is going to come because Christ said it would. He never promised um, smooth sailing in our lives. And yet we've been very blessed in this country, despite some of the things you may see and hear around us. Our doors are open this morning. Our lights are on. People know we're here. We're going to have this broadcast up online. We're not hiding anything. But that's. But we also have no threat of, of being thrown in prison. Um, I know we hear some of this stuff this day and age, um, things that people would like to pass in order to stop certain things and make it more difficult. Um, some of this stuff is fringe. Some of this stuff will probably come to pass at some point in time. Who knows? But these people were forced out of their homes and their livelihoods. 
um, probably nothing more than the clothes on their backs. And they spread out and they continue to be faithful to preach the gospel. Their hearts were more concerned about lost souls than their own lives and livelihood. And so our, our hearts burden for lost souls around us. And so far in the book of Acts, we've seen Stephen's death continue to produce results. It spread to Samaria, Acts chapter 8, which resulted in the Samaritans coming to faith in Christ. It moved Saul to persecute the church more vigorously, which resulted in Saul's con conversion on the road to Damascus. And also, I believe it also resulted in the church fanning or scattering the seed even further out. And thirdly, it, it resulted in, um, now here in chapter 11, verse 19, we see it resulting in the spread of the gospel to the Gentile lands, Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. So we come now to a, a new geographical location, um, Antioch. <clears throat> believers ended up some 300 miles north of Jerusalem. That's about roughly where Antioch is in location to Jerusalem. Um, that's like from where we are here in the North Shore, roughly, I mean, give or take, to about Allentown, Pennsylvania. Now, with modern transportation, that doesn't seem too, too bad, but they didn't have anything but I mean, at best, they may have a donkey, a horse, a camel, something like that. But most traveling was done on foot. And so 300 miles is quite a distance. Uh, we also take for granted that if we were to make a, a journey on foot today, we'd still have, for the most part, paved roads the whole way to get there um, in, some, in some fashion, right? They didn't always have that. Though there were many roads and highways, they weren't exactly the same that we have today. And the perils were probably a lot more serious in those journeys. And so <clears throat> it spread all the way out 300 miles north to Antioch, north of Jerusalem. So Antioch is the, it was the capital city of Syria. Uh, not to be confused because in chapter 13 of Acts, we'll also see an Antioch in of Pesada, uh, not, not the same one. And apparently there were many Antiochs in the ancient world, but this one in particular was the icing on the cake. This was the, the grandest of them all. This was the third largest city in the Roman Empire um, after Rome and Alexandria. Um, it had a population of around half a million people. Uh, this ancient city truly was a sight to behold. They said the main, the main street in the city was over four miles long and it was paved with marble. And along each side were um, colonnades and they were all marble. I don't know how big they were, but four miles of these colonnades, columns, that stretched over the length of this main street in the city that was paved in marble. So it was a lot of marble. Um, I don't know about you, but marble's a little expensive. Try to get marble countertops or something else, it's, it's gonna cost a pretty penny. So this was, this was some serious luxury stuff. Um, supposedly because of the magnificent architecture of the city, that it was given the, the name Antioch, the golden or queen of the east. It was the only city at this time to have its streets lit at night. So it had um, street lamps. One writer says the following about this city, a busy port and a center for luxury and culture. It was right on the Mediterranean Sea there. Antioch attracted all kinds of people, including wealthy, retired Roman officials who spent their days chatting in the baths or gambling at the races with its large cosmopolitan population and its great commercial and political power, Antioch presented to the church an exciting opportunity for evangelism. Maybe we could somewhat think of New York City um, in, the US, in the United States. It's a, it's a very big city. Um, if you've been to other cities and then you go to New York, it doesn't, or if you spend any time in New York City and then you go to other cities, they don't quite feel the same. Um, New York feels like it just goes on and on and on. Um, if you walk through the streets of Manhattan and even if you go into the boroughs, it's, um, they're, they're larger and they're stretching further. And so it's, it's quite a, a sight, but also quite an opportunity to, for evangelizing. And so with that description, it doesn't take much imagination to understand that this city was also full of great wickedness. Um, of course, being a pagan city, it had all of the you know, major trimmings of the 
goddesses and goddess uh, gods and goddesses, the temples, the temple prostitution. Obviously, I already mentioned the bathhouses and, and, and race tracks and the games and other things that would part um, would have um, been part of the culture there. And so, obviously, there was also a great repetition or reputation for wickedness. Um, some say second to Corinth. And Corinth, as we know, to be called a Corinthian was an insult because it was such a de debauched city of, full of all kinds of just awful things. Even, even Romans and Greek pagan people were offended by the Corinthians and the way they lived. And so Antioch had a lot of that stuff as well. And so let's return to our text, though. It's, you know, some people don't like the, ge uh, the, the geographical stuff. I enjoy it, but I try to keep it short so that I don't bore you to death with so much of this. Um, when we return to our text here, let's look, at, let's look again at verses 19, and we'll read down to 21. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. There were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and the great number who believed turned to the Lord. So verse 19, we have the preparation. We already said, or already noted here, the scattering by persecution. This brought the early believers out of the comfort of residing together in Jerusalem, and it pushed them out to the surrounding cities as far as Antioch. And so in addition, addition to that, <clears throat> whoops, um, we have number two, also the preaching. They were preaching the gospel at first only to the Jews, and this was for the most part due to ignorance. Um, they, they believed it was for the Jewish people. They had been just in Jerusalem. They were there at Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. They saw it, you know, um, Day by day, the church was growing, but it was it was Jewish people that were coming to faith in Christ at this time. And so they didn't really understand all of this. They had a, an ignorance, not an arrogance, but an ignorance. And of course, they're not familiar with what's going on with in, in Caesarea with Peter and the Gentiles. They didn't they don't know about they might not even know about Samaria and Philip evangelizing there. And they probably certainly don't know about the Ethiopian eunuch that Philip also evangelized. Uh, on the road there. And so being so far north from Jerusalem, there was really no way they could have known about the events that had unfolded with regards to Peter and the Gentiles. Lacking this inform information resulted in them holding on to the idea that this was for the Jews only. But then we have progress. Verse 20, but there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. But naturally, the believers who became refugees in Antioch, again, a very pagan, a very Gentile city, were true born-again believers, and therefore the gospel wasn't going to stay contained in the Jewish realm for long. These men weren't just giving lip service. These were truly new creatures in Christ, regenerated men who were filled with the Holy Spirit. And because the gospel was not intended solely for the Jews, it was most certainly going to take this route. The men of Cyprus, it's an island uh, not far from Antioch in Cyrene, a city in North Africa. Um, these men are Hellenists, and I refer to them as Hellenists in the sense of Acts chapter 6, verse 1. If you read, Recall, we talked about that term, and it referred to Greek-speaking Jews. They came to Antioch, and they spoke with Hellenists. Now, don't get confused, because when Luke uses the term Hellenists here in chapter 11, he's actually referring to Greeks, uh, Greek-speaking non-Jews, or we could just say Gentiles. Not exactly sure why. I was trying to look into why using the same term. I mean, the term in general, really just means of a Hellenist is someone who has been influenced, um, speaks Greek, or is in the Greek uh, realm of things. And so, again, Hellenists, the Jews that were Hellenists, it's because they were born in Greek-speaking lands. They spoke Greek. They didn't speak their Aramaic language. But just to differentiate, Acts chapter 6, verse 1, when they mention the Hellenists, like Stephen and Philip, 
They're talking about Jewish men who were born in Greek cities and spoke Greek. Here, when, they, when it says the word Hellenist, they're referring to Greek-speaking Gentiles. It is said that there, were, there was a healthy Jewish population in Antioch. And so they obviously did have an area to evangelize the Jewish people there. But even though, um, um, but however, they certainly, there was going to be a majority of people that were going to be uh, pagan, that were going to be Greek Gentiles. And so naturally, as I said, for the born again believer, they were not going to, it wasn't going to take long before it started taking route in this direction. And there was a connection because of the, their background as Hellenists, Greek speaking um, Jews and the, and the non-Greeks, or, uh, and the Greek speaking non-Jews, eventually they're going to engage in conversation or have interactions. And so naturally the gospel continued to spread. And glory to God that they were moved to speak to the Gentiles there. And so preaching the Lord Jesus, simple message, probably similar, no doubt, to what Peter presented to Cornelius in his household, preaching the Lord Jesus. Um, these unnamed helpers promoted the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentile world. They did this with a simple gospel message. Preaching the Lord Jesus, the facts, his life, death, and resurrection. These helpers to present Jesus as the Jewish Messiah and going to the Old Testament prophecies would have had little interest for the Gentile pagans. I mean, they really wouldn't have been that interested if they started talking about the Jewish Messiah, do you know about the Jewish Messiah or the Messiah that we're waiting for? That they're pagans. They don't really have any background or any connection with this. And so going into all that wouldn't have been very um, beneficial. But talking about a holy God, I mean, these were men that were familiar with temples and gods and goddesses, right? But they were always man-made gods and goddesses with, with man-made traits and, and attributes. And they presented a holy God, a righteous God. An uncreated God, right? I am that I am, as, as he introduces himself to Moses. I am that I am. He is self-existing. Even when you think about the attributes of God, um, there are things that he is. They're not components, right? We have components. Um, we have a heart, mind, a soul, a spirit. God is, but that's things that were created. That's the things that God has given to us. But God has... None of that because he is God. He is always, is always existing. He is a self-existing God. And so this is clearly something they've never even heard of before. And so they speak to them about the facts of the gospel that God sent his son, who lived and died and rose again. And so we, we've covered now the preparation and the progress in Antioch. Now we come to verse 21, the power. It says, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The hand of the Lord, this is a statement seen throughout the scriptures, and it indicates one of two things. Either the hand of the Lord refers to God's power expressed in judgment, or God's power expressed in blessing. An example of God's judgment, 1 Samuel 5, 6, the hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod, and he terrified and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. So the hand of the Lord is, is an example of judgment, of cursing. But you also have an example in Nehemiah. And it says, <clears throat> um, with regards to Nehemiah, Nehemiah 2, 8, uh, the 18 isn't supposed to be there, so please forgive me for that. It says in a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's force, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. Now, before this, Nehemiah was a man who was a cupbearer, in the, in the king's court, and um, he gained favor with the king, needed to rebuild the walls of the temple. But he also spent four months fasting and praying. And so we see the results of God's faithfulness to that faithful servant of blessing him and getting the materials that he needed to do the work and getting the support he needed to rebuild the walls 
a wonderful, wonderful book to study to Nehemiah and Ezra. Now, so we see that God's the hand of the Lord. In this case, obviously, we know it's a hand of blessing. It was a blessing upon the, the work of these unnamed faithful believers. And 21 continues, and a great number who believe turn to the Lord. We've seen this happen over, <clears throat> um, hand over fist, and time after time of the Lord blessing and increasing his church in the book of Acts. And so you're there in, in, your, in the book of Acts. Just flip back with me. To Acts 2, verse 47, and we see here, it says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, then the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. He was adding. Luke's keeping a record of this. And we see this again in Acts 4, 4. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Now, Acts chapter 5, verse 14, it says, And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. In 6, verse 1 there, the first part of the verse says, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, they were increasing. And then Acts chapter 6, verse 7, and the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Let's flip over to Acts chapter 9, verse 31. <clears throat> it says, The church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. And then again, that same chapter, verse uh, chapter 9, verse 35, and all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. Chapter 9, verse 42, and it became known throughout all Joppa and many believed in the Lord. In Acts chapter 10, verse 44, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. We know that's Cornelius in the house, and he had gathered his family and guests, and they were, they were ready to receive the gospel. So God continued to increase <clears throat> and give his hand of blessing. And that brings us up to 11. And I know we didn't get to verse 24 yet, but... We'll look at it anyways because we'll, we'll pass by it shortly here. It says here, well, actually, it says it in two places. At the end of verse 21 in chapter 11, it says, And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. And then again in verse 24, And a great many people were added to the Lord. And so we see God's, the hand of the Lord is blessing this ministry here and continues to do so. And Luke, I'm grateful, keeps a record of this because that is such a wonderful encouragement because if you remember all through Acts 2, in, in many ways they have been facing um, conflict and criticism and persecution and all this, and yet it still continues to grow and grow and grow. We see this over and over again. And now we come to verses 22 through 24 it is the nourishment and encouragement of the church and so we have the birth of the church in antioch and now we have the nourishment and encouragement of the church let's read these verses starting at verse 22 the report of this came to the ears of the church in jerusalem and they sent barnabas to antioch and when he came and saw the grace of god he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. First, the report. Verse 22, the report. Someone or, or someones 
brought news back to the mother church in Jerusalem of what was happening in Antioch. We don't know how this happened. We don't know if it was somebody who was traveling or if it was someone who specifically said, we need to go report this back because Gentiles are coming into the faith. We're not sure. Could have been um, with good intentions or could have been with some ill intentions of, of a complaint maybe even. But regardless, the news reaches back to Jerusalem. We don't know. Um, we don't know any other specifics other than that the report was presented to the to the leads in Jerusalem. And if I remember again, it's about some 300 miles, so that's a pretty um, dedicated trip to make to present this report. And they send a very faithful, generous, and encouraging servant who was originally from Cyprus himself to look into the report that has been received about the Gentiles in Antioch, about them coming to Christ in a great number. It's curious that they didn't send Peter. However, Peter may have been elsewhere at this time, or maybe that is exactly the point. As Peter, in their thinking, they may have thought we'll have a bias in this report because obviously his report from Caesarea with the Gentiles coming to faith, and oh, maybe they've chosen to send another um, apostle, another faithful servant there um, outside of, of Peter because of that. We don't know exactly why. But regardless of why they sent Barnabas, we know they did, and we know God's divine hand was upon this. Now we'll look more in depth at Barnabas next week as I want to take a little more time to develop uh, his portfolio. His profile is there's quite a bit to be said about him in Scripture. But, um, well, we just don't want to rush through it, is the point. And so we, we, we'll look at him some more. But anyways, they send Barnabas, and so he arrives in Antioch. It's in verse 23, the support. He arrives in Antioch to see the grace of God. To see the grace of God. It isn't something that we physically see or touch tangibly, but the effects of the grace of God are clearly seen. What Barnabas witnessed in Antioch was the grace of God pouring out into the Gentiles. He could see the transformation. He could see what they were doing, probably similar to what Peter saw when Cornelius and his house came. They were extolling, they were worshiping, they were praising God. They were being fed, and they needed to be fed. They needed men there. Who could teach them and so he sees this and he's seeing the grace of god and he can this is evident that god is working here this is something that for many of the early jewish believers was still not easy to accept as we will see later on in the book of acts there is still opposition to the gentiles coming to faith in christ but not with barnabas he's glad Means to, he was rejoicing, or the word in Greek actually means to exceedingly rejoice. He was rejoicing with what was happening to the Gentiles there. He exhorts or strengthens or encourages them appropriately, appropriately as Barnabas' name means son of encouragement. Now, that's not his name. That's the nickname that the apostles gave him back in um, Acts chapter 4, verse 36, I believe, where they gave him the nickname or title, Barnabas, means son of encouragement. His name is Joseph, um, but it's a, it's a good and fitting name, and, they, and these are the kinds of details that God preserves in his word for us for a reason. He's exhorting them. He's, he's giving them strength and encouragement. And the Greek word used for exhort is to call to one side, to come alongside a person. Now think about this for a minute, too. Yes, you can get a text or a phone call or an email um, that can give encouragement. Absolutely. I've received texts from folks uh, here in this church, sometimes after a service on a Sunday or maybe in the week sometime, and it's a huge blessing and a huge encouragement. But for the most part, when we think of encouraging someone, really you think of coming alongside them. You know, it's not that encouraging if you're like, I see you over there, Gino. You're doing a good job. Just, just stay over there, though. You know, you, you come alongside with them. You get close with them. You encourage them. He's there, and this word that is used in the Greek is describing that, of coming alongside somebody. He's there. He's exhorting them. He's encouraging them to stay faithful now to what they have received. 
he wasn't just encouraging them at a random at random or because it seems fitting to do he was encouraging them as a young as young believers to remain faithful to the lord with steadfast purpose the exhortation reflects this concern that every pastor feels for new converts that they continue in the faith this exhortation will be a theme of sorts in the book of acts with paul and barnabas as they they repeat this exhortation to believers to stay faithful um, i think in chapter 13 and, and somewhere and later on in the book of acts again a few times and so the only way to remain true to the lord or faithful to the lord is by being in his word and this is where god reveals himself it's his word this is why it was so important for them to get faithful men there to teach them in Antioch, to prepare them for ministry, to spend time with them. It wasn't a one and done. It wasn't like, I see that hand, praise the Lord, you're saved, now you're on your own. It was, they came alongside and they ministered. And, and <clears throat> we're not going to get there today, but we're going to see how this is, this is an urgency that needs to be addressed. And Barnabas is willing to go the distance to go track down Saul, because this is what this is what Christ had pulled sets, um, Saul apart for, the ministry to the Gentiles, to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And so God reveals himself in his word. 1 John 2, 24, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. So how is God's word going to abide in us if we don't read it, if we don't listen to it? If we don't meditate on it, we must be in his word. And they must be in, the, in God's word. And, and Barnabas knew this. <clears throat> and now we come to verse 24, the success. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Bar Barnabas was the right man for the job. He, ex he exhibited the spiritual qualities We've seen in other faithful servants, such as Stephen and Philip. He was full of the Holy Spirit and faith. That's how those, those seven faithful men back in uh, chapter 6 were described, those Hellenists, being full of the Holy Spirit and faith and of wisdom. And Barnabas um, exhibits the same qualities. And it says, and a great many people were added to the Lord. And once again, Luke, as we've already observed this morning, he chronicles the progress of the church. The harvest was certainly plentiful in Antioch, and Barnabas was in need of help. So next week we will we'll pick up here in verse 25, where Barnabas travels to Tarsus in search of Saul, and we'll spend a little more time looking at the um, profile of Barnabas and and the importance of his um, con contributions that God used him for and left for us in his word. And so we will continue on. But before we do, I just, as we finish there, talking about how the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. And the same thing could be said at that time. There wasn't enough workers in Antioch for the harvest there. And so they needed to get support. Barnabas needed help. The people there needed help. Folks, we have the same mission today. And so, do you know Jesus? Are you saved? Do you know how it happens? You know, 1 Samuel 2.2 2 says, There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. God is holy. We're not talking about a man-made God, something we can fit in a box, something that we can handle or physically see we're talking about a holy god totally separate if you're with us on wednesday nights we talked a little bit about this how god is totally separate he is a holy god <clears throat> peter echoes these um echoes some words that are recorded for us in Levitic, leviticus chapter 19 but in first peter 1 15 and 16 it says but as he who called you out is holy you also be holy in all your conduct since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Well, here's the question. If God is totally separate and holy, how are we to be holy? Is it, is it by our own merit and works and efforts? 
It's not possible. We know this. As it is written, none is righteous. That's what we're told in Romans 3.10. No, not one. In Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So how are we to be holy? How is a person who is lost or doesn't have a relationship with Christ to be holy? Are we holy because we have put in all the efforts, as I just said? No. And they won't. By putting in efforts and going to church and putting money in the plate or all these other things, it's not going to make them holy. In fact, all we do in our earnings as sinful people is we, it says for the wages of sin is death. That's what we earn is death. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is why the, the death, the burial, resurrection of Christ is so important and key and fundamental for the gospel. When Christ was on the cross, he didn't just um, suffer a painful death. Thousands, of, if not millions of people were crucified on crosses. He took the full blunt of God's wrath upon himself. God imputed our punishment on his son, a perfect, holy, spotless lamb. And he took the righteousness of Christ and imputed it, placed it upon those who are believers. And so... This is that powerful work of the gospel. We are not righteous on our own merit or efforts whatsoever. The wages of sin is death. Romans 5a, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Friend, do you know that? Christ died for you. Regardless of what you've done, what you've said, where you've been, he didn't wait for us to get cleaned up and then die for us or then offer us salvation. He died for us now as we are so that he can impute his righteousness to us and take our sin upon the cross. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Hebrews 3, 15, As as it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart, as in the rebellion. Do not harden your heart. John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So the wrath of God still remains. We've talked about this before, and I don't mean to be a broken record, but it's not Old Testament God was a wrathful God, New Testament God is a loving God. He's the same God. He's immutable. He doesn't change. Wrath is still there, but it's not for the believer. And so, friend, if you're outside, if you are not a believer, come to Christ. Call out to Jesus today for salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, 2, For he says, In a favorable time I listened to you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. It's today. God has stirred your heart and you don't know Christ as your Savior today. Don't put it off. You know, many of us know about the tragedy of the submarine. Do you think those men went in there thinking they were going to be dead within a few hours or within 45 minutes? We don't know exactly when, but in, in the way that they did die. I imagine most people that get in their car that never make it to their job or never make it home, they don't think, probably going to die. I just, they're not thinking about it at all. We don't think about these things, but yet we're surrounded by death because people are dying every day. And so don't, friend, don't put this off. You have no idea how many breaths are left in your lungs, how many beats are left in your heart. You truly do not. And most of us will probably know at least one person in our lives that was pre, you know, in our human understanding, we would say it's prematurely taken out. Of course, God's timing is, is always just and perfect and everything. But we would say they were young. Even when my grandfather died, I remember a man, a lost man, saying, because he was 77 when he passed, saying, wow, it's just so young. And at that time, I was kind of thinking, I guess I didn't think it was that young. But, but then I thought about it, and I thought, well, it is pretty young. I mean, it's just a few decades of life, and then you're gone. Praise the Lord, he was a believer. But that man said that as an unbeliever, and he wants 
he wants to live as long as he can because this is, for his, in his opinion, this is all there ever will be. But he's wrong. There's a resurrection for both the, the saved and the unsaved. Once to life, once to everlasting separation in hell. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, as we finish, for by God's grace, by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. If you're going to boast, boast in this. Jesus Christ died for a wretched sinner. That's it. That's the only thing we've ever brought to the table with our sin. And a boat, it's a boast in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> well, let's finish with a song.